Good morning, and welcome to the online worship service of the Lighthouse Methodist Church, where we continue to receive the light, be the light, and share the light of Jesus Christ. We are delighted you are joining us for this online worship service, and we hope those who are at their summer residence are joining us as well. Please continue to pay special attention to the newsletter that is emailed to you each week as it contains information regarding church news and mission outreach. As we approach the beginning of our season, when many of you return to Florida, we want to share with you some plans for October. First, there will be a communion service held outdoors on the lawn of the Boca Bay Pass Club on October 4th. The following Sunday, October 11th, we will return to live streaming the service and open the sanctuary for in-person worship for anyone who chooses to attend. The church council is meeting via Zoom in the next few days to finalize the procedures for the service. Also, please save the date, October 24th, from 4 to 6 for a family gathering outside at the church. More details will be announced in the midweek newsletter. Finally, please continue with your generous giving of your tithes and offerings. This concludes the announcement portion of the service, and wherever you are, we hope you are safe and healthy. And now let's prepare our hearts for worship.
Good morning, children of God. Jesus loves you and so do I. So as we continue our discussion about Moses and the Ten Commandments, and we remember that Moses went up the mountain through clouds of smoke and thunder and lightning and trumpets, and most people would be afraid. The people on the ground were afraid. The Israelites were afraid, but Moses was not. Moses knew that God was there and God would look out for him and protect him. And so he continued on his journey unafraid because he knew that he could trust God, just as God knew that he could trust Moses, because all through Moses' life, God had been giving him little tests and challenging him along the way. When God came to Moses in the burning bush, Moses didn't run away. When God said, lead my, my people out of Egypt, Moses didn't run away. When God said, Moses, raise your staff and part the Red Sea to save the Israelites, Moses did. He didn't run away. And when the people were hungry and they were angry and, and Moses went to God and God gave manna and quail, to the Israelites so that they would be fed. Moses didn't run away. And so now, as we see Moses going up the mountain, once again, he's not afraid. He is there. He's following his faith. He's doing what God is asking him to do and continues to do what God has asked him to do. And so let's go to our, our instruction book, our Bible, and let's talk about where it says in Exodus, it's in chapter 20, verse 20. And it says, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that your fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. And so we need to remember that too, because God wasn't just testing the people of Israel. He was also testing Moses, and today he tests us. And so when we have small challenges in life and things come up, we know that God can be testing us. And as we look at those commandments, every once in a while, you'll find something where you're being tested. And so we know that things might not always be easy, and it might be easy to do the wrong thing. But think about God testing us to see. And once we start to feel um, those tests that we're, that we're being challenged with and we're meeting those challenges, and then God's going to give us larger tests and give us larger assignments. And that's how we grow. That's how we grow as human beings. That's how we grow in our faith. Um, and so we just need to remember that when those tests come up, Look for that inner strength that God has given to you. You know that he's there beside you, and you know that he's there to help you. And so when you have that chance to do something wrong, say, nope, God's testing me. I'm going to do the right thing. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we know that you are there to help us grow, to make us expand, for us to learn new things, and, and for our hearts to be stronger and our souls to be stronger. And we know that you do that through your testing of us. Help us to rise to the challenge. Help us to meet your tests, exceed your expectations, and know that we love you and that we trust you and that we will always be paying attention to what you have offer us. And we thank you, Lord, in the name of your Son. Amen and Amen. Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship. And thank you for welcoming me to your church to worship with you today. My name is Cynthia Weems, and I serve as District Superintendent of the Southeast District of the Florida Conference. This district runs from Delray Beach to Key West, the Fort Lauderdale and Miami areas, and I am preaching to you today from my home in Coral Gables. Thank you for allowing me to be with you, and I've been to your community. 
It's a beautiful place. And I want to thank you for the ways that you serve in that community and far, far beyond. I am aware of your ministries around the globe, and they are a great gift to the church. Thank you all for being the church in this very challenging time. Today, as we reflect on scripture from the prophet Jeremiah, we'll be thinking together about what it means to be the church today and into the future. Let us hear now from Jeremiah verse, chapter 18, verses 1 to 6. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done? says the Lord, just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. This is God's word for God's people this day. Thanks be to God. When I was a little girl, my grandmother told my sister and me at an early age, that she had purchased two sets of china for us, one for each of us. My brothers did not get such a gift, but my sister and I would receive our china when we, you can finish the sentence, got married. Well, my sister, though younger, was married before I was, and she was able to pick her china pack. I, on the other hand, apparently delayed too long. One year when I was in my late 20s, I was staying with my grandmother for an extended time because she had been sick. When I was planning to leave her home, she said one day, Cynthia, since it appears as though you won't be getting married anytime soon, I'm going to give you your china. So she lovingly boxed it up for me, and I drove it back home. I moved it into my first parsonage. I was about to begin my first appointment, my first church. And I thought to myself, hot dog, I'm really going to need this china. Perhaps you, like me, have struggled with a misguided impression of the Christian life. You see, for many years in my life, I thought of my Christian life a bit like China in a China cabinet. Perfect, spotless, everything matching everybody else, nothing out of place, and certainly no, no scrapes or scars or, or scuffs or cracks. Perhaps you, like I, learned through years of some tears and heartache, that that notion of the spiritual life, that we're meant to be unbroken, perfect, and matching, is inaccurate. Through life's hurts and trials, we, we find out that there are better images for the Christian life than fine china. The image we see today in Jeremiah 18 is a wonderful one, isn't it? It's one I've been drawn to over the years when my own life just could not compare to find China anymore. This idea that God molds us and shapes us and knows what to do when we are spoiled and, and troubled, misshapen, is a beautiful image, isn't it? It's comforting, it's, it's challenging, and it's certainly something that has come to ring true in, in my own life. But I have found that it is not only true for me personally, but it is true for the church. Serving in United Methodist churches for over 20 years, I've come to see this image of God as a potter at the potter's wheel as a really helpful one in thinking about how we do our work 
as churches. Now let's be honest. The North American church has long taken pride in associating itself with things like fine china. Amen? Perhaps that's why I long compared my own Christian life to it. Or maybe it was the poofy Easter dresses and the bonnets and the patent leather shoes. I don't know. It will not come as a surprise to you that my grandmother was a loyal United Methodist, that she had her 50-year pin with the United Methodist women, that she was her church treasurer for 30 years, and she loved fine china. They all go together, don't they? There is something about the North American church that screams china cabinet. Beautiful, everything matching, a place setting for everyone, no piece out of place, a matching pattern for all, and in a cabinet that's locked most of the week. Ouch. That hurts just a little bit, doesn't it? There is so much for us to learn in our personal lives and in the life of the church when we dig into this image from Jeremiah 18. Perhaps you, like I, come from images where perfection and matching, yes, and, and no scuffs and scrapes makes for a good life. But we know that we don't find this image in Scripture. There is no pattern of fine china there, but rather a potter at the potter's wheel. This is the image we find in Scripture. We don't find pr pretty patterns or locked cabinets or matching sets of breakable dishware. We don't. We find God with the messy, unpredictable results of sitting at the potter's wheel. Our translation today of Jeremiah 18 says that the vessel he was making was spoiled in the potter's hand and that he reworked it as seemed good to him. Spoiled is translated in other ways in other versions of Scripture. Some of them are marred, ruined, damaged, imperfect, turned out badly, something went wrong. Does that sound like your life, the life of someone you love? Does it sound like your neighborhood? What does the potter's wheel have to teach us about our image of ourselves, humanity, and our church? As a superintendent, I work with churches and churches do struggle. They struggle with sometimes thinking their buildings, for example, are a bit like China in China cabinets, meant to be locked away and secured. But more and more of our churches are having trouble with those very buildings, perhaps like, like yours. We also find that churches are thriving in places where they are moving away from their property and beginning to think creatively about new ministries. Sometimes new ministries that happen on the very lawns and grounds and, and property of the, of the church building, and oftentimes ministries that happen in other places where we're meeting people and joining together with them. The church in the world. Some of these creative opportunities for ministry have me amazed. Perhaps you too listen to some of them. We have a church meeting in a tattoo parlor in North Central Florida. In Northeast Florida, we have a church where people meet on Sunday mornings and go kayaking together. In the middle of the ride, they stop, they have a message and read scripture and share communion and they get right back in their kayaks. That's church. Last year, the Florida Conference began a new church in a women's prison also in North Central Florida. Wow, church and a tattoo parlor and, and on a river with kayaks 
and in a prison. This is a different way of looking at the church. This feels like a church that's been put on the potter's wheel, yes? A church that rather being locked behind a, ca behind a cabinet, pretty and precious, a church that's on the potter's wheel, that's being molded and shaped constantly from what it was to what it is meant to be, what God's designs are for that church. My passion, and I know it is yours too, is for the church of the future to be a thriving church, a vital church, a growing church. And when I say church, I don't mean the church building. I really mean the church, the people called followers of Jesus. You know as well as I do that fine china ends up in one of two places, either in a locked cabinet snug in the corner of a dining room, like in my house, or in a rummage sale. We don't want that for our church, do we? We want our churches to be thriving, to be in the midst of their communities, to be full of joy. But to do that, we need a different image. We have to cast aside the image of the, of the fine china in the cabinet. We need an image of God as the potter and our church on the potter's wheel, ready to be transformed. One evening at dinner some time ago, I asked my daughter, who's 14 now, to look at my grandmother's china. Don't get me wrong, I still love my grandmother's china, and it has moved with me to every parsonage I've lived in, and it's always been snug in the china cabinet in my dining room. I asked my daughter to look at it, and I said, Sweetie, when you look at my grandmother's china, what words come to mind? She thought for a minute. She said, Pretty, fragile, untouchable distant. I said, well, sweetie, if you think of one word that sums up your relationship with my grandmother's china, which will one day be yours, I wanted to say, what would that word be? She said, irrelevant. And then she said, mom, why are you asking me so many questions about this china? I don't, I don't ever think about it. We only use it on special occasions. Oh, her words were like a dagger in my heart. We only use the fine china on Christmas and Easter. How ironic, we might say. How ironic. Friends, I see the way my daughter stares at the china cabinet in our dining room. She knows it's there. She knows the dishes come out once or twice a year. She knows not to put them in the dishwasher. She knows they're breakable, fragile, untouchable. And I don't want my daughter to think about the church the way she thinks about my grandmother's china. Pretty, but useless, irrelevant. The image of God as the potter on the potter's wheel reminds us that God knows what God is doing. God knows what to do with our flaws, our human flaws as people, and God knows what to do with our flaws as a church. God does. God knows what to do, how to remold and reshape us. We just have to let go of our grip. We just have to be willing to put our lives on the potter's wheel, and we have to be willing to put our church on the potter's wheel saying to God, remold us, reshape us. Oh Lord, we pray. You noticed at the end of Jeremiah, there was no finished product. Did you, did you hear that? There's no finished product. Jeremiah instructed, was instructed to watch the potter at the wheel. He saw how the, the clay was remolded and reshaped, but it never gets fired. It never gets glazed. Jeremiah 
is instructed to watch the potter at work, at work at the wheel, molding and remolding. Indeed, just as the clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. Sisters and brothers, may it be so for us, God's people and God's church. Let us pray. Thank you, God, that you are the potter. Remold and reshape our lives and the life of our church. Lord, that our future might look like you want it to look. That our church might be the church you want it to be. Lord, remold us, reshape us, we pray. Amen. There is one God, and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great, indeed, is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Weems, for today's message. And Father, we thank you for your word from the prophet Jeremiah. As we go before the Lord in prayer, let us consider what it means when we pray. Remold us, reshape us, O Lord, we pray. What does it mean to place ourselves in the potter's hands? Yielding to the potter's hands requires confession of our sin. 
Lord, we confess that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Let us take a moment to confess our sins to the Lord. <clears throat> Amen. Yielding to the potter's hands means acknowledging that God is sovereign and knows what's best for us. Lord, we acknowledge your sovereignty over our lives. Mold us and shape us as seems best to you. Yielding to the potter's hands means letting go and letting God be God. Lord, we release all of ourselves to you. Help us to let go of all things that keep us separated from you. May you make us useful for your kingdom, we pray. Lord, as you remold and reshape us, we pray that you will use us as your body, the church, to spread the gospel message to our communities in which we serve. May we be open to new and different ways that seem good to you to bless others as you have blessed us. Remold us, reshape us, O Lord, we pray. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for those impacted by the COVID pandemic. We lift up those who have lost loved ones. Give them comfort. Those who have suffered job loss, give them hope. Those who serve as our first responders, give them strength those who work to create a vaccine, give them wisdom. And Father, for those in our midst, we lift the following. Lewis, brother of Kathy Husted, and his family as his body shuts down from cancer. Lord, give them all your peace. John Mitchell, we praise you for answered prayer and we pray for full and complete healing for John. We praise you, Lord, for the healing work you have done in the lives of Richard Klepser, Ray Smedley, and Chris Rembold. Continue to strengthen them each day. And for Kevin McNamara, friend of Richard Klepser, we pray for his healing. Father, we lift all of our prayers to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, our Creator, Redeemer, and our Sustainer. Amen. Amen.